the heavens are telling of the glory of God. Look up and seek His wisdom from above. Welcome back for part three of this study on Isaiah 714. If you didn't start with part one, there's a link right up here to that, and I hope you'll watch these in order. Who is the virgin and the child? Let's begin by talking about the word that's translated virgin or maiden in some translations. It's often argued that the word doesn't necessarily indicate a virgin, but simply a young woman. I'll let lexicographers argue that out concerning use outside of the Old Testament. However, its use in Scripture is pretty set. This word is applied to Rebekah in Genesis 24, 43, but back in verse 16, another word is used and qualified to clearly indicate that she was a virgin. In Exodus 2 and verse 8, the same word as Isaiah 7, 14 is used of Miriam. We don't know her age, but she seems to still be at home and not yet married. In Psalm 68, 25, this word is used of virgins playing timbrels in the sanctuary. I don't know anyone who would argue that a maiden other than one who was chaste would be allowed in the sanctuary. In Proverbs 30, verses 18 through 19, we have a numerical proverb ending at four. There are three things which are too wonderful for me, four which I do not understand. The way of an eagle in the sky, the way of a serpent on a rock, the way of a ship in the middle of the sea, and the way of a man with a maid or virgin. It's argued that she can't be a virgin if a man has had her. But that is not the point. If you remember the way these proverbs work, and I'll put a link up here to a video touching on that, the fourth item is the point of the entire enigma. Here the virgin is contrasted with the adulterous woman in the next verse, verse 20. The point is found in her virginity, not the relations the two have with each other. In Song of Songs, chapter 1 and verse 3, it hardly seems likely that the bride would be extolling the virtues of her beloved by talking about all the young maidens he's had relations with. In chapter 6 and verse 8, the women are classified, and it seems completely reasonable that the maidens are virgins in this court. Then lastly, we have this passage in Isaiah 7. As you can see, there really isn't any evidence that the word is used in Scripture of a young maiden who's not a virgin. In fact, when the Greek translation of the Old Testament was made, called the Septuagint, the men most familiar with the Hebrew language translated this word as parthenos, meaning a virgin. If you'd like to dig a little more deeply into the meanings of words in Isaiah 7, consult the Isaiah commentary by Franz Dielich. On the meaning of this prophecy, he takes what I would call a foreshortening view, and of the classic scholars, comes about as close as any to a view that I would most agree with. And that's the spoiler for any who want to dig out his work and see where I'm going. Along about now, some viewers might be shouting, but look at the context, Bob. Well, I understand, because as I always say, context is king. It can tell us of unusual word meanings or usages, so that's where we're going next. But since we're nearly out of time, I'll point out another interpretation by a scholar I highly respect. You've heard me quote from Milton Terry a number of times. He wrote an outstanding work on Bible interpretation over a hundred years ago. He views Isaiah 7:14 as a case of a type being used. Rather than a double fulfillment, he explains that the child of chapter 8 is the type, with Jesus being the antitype, the higher realization or fullness of the prophecy. That's an interesting view, and I've put a reference at the bottom of the screen if you'd like to see how he defends that. So no time for anything further at this point, so I'll just say that we're going to wrap this study of Isaiah 7:14 up in our next video. Please join me as I tell you how I believe we should view Isaiah 714.